Welcome. Uh, today we're here in Axiom's anechoic chamber, which we thought was a very appropriate place for this video, which we'll get into a bit later. But today we want to talk about something called the family of curves. And it's really a topic that uh, we feel is just not talked about enough. And um, it's a topic that is uh, extremely important to the sound of a loudspeaker, what you're actually going to hear in the room and how we, how we determine that. Um, and as for why it's not talked about enough, I think that um, probably two reasons. Uh, one is it's not, there's nothing visual about the family of curves in that you can't look at the product and say, oh, um, this is going to have a particular family of curves just by what the drivers look like or the cabinet looks like or the components on the crossover look like. And none of these things really tell you much of anything about the family of curves. So there tends to be, you tend to gravitate and talk about things that you can see. Um, uh, I, I mean, that that's sensible in one hand, uh, but really not getting into the sort of meat and potatoes of what makes a good sounding loudspeaker versus a not so good sounding loudspeaker. And probably the other reason it's not talked about that much is that um, the family of curves is not an easy thing to uh, measure. There are a lot of curves involved and you really have to have an anechoic chamber in order to take all of these curves. So it's, it's, probably, it's probably not talked about in a lot of cases because uh, it's probably not measured. But um, even just looking at a simple loudspeaker, say a two-way uh, two bookshelf speaker, you're probably looking at uh, over 150 curves in order to create the entire uh, family of curves that then you will work with and manipulate to create what is going to be the uh, end product. I mean, you've got uh, the curves of all of the individual drivers, uh, and then you've got the, the, the curves of the combined end product. And, um, you know, that's going to give you 150 curves plus. But realistically, in the process of the design, you're going to be doing those over and over and over again, at least a certain number of them. And uh, you, you really can end up in a design over a thousand curves uh, before you're done. Uh, easily and that's for a simple bookshelf speaker if you get into a multi-driver tower you can start multiplying that number by two three four times so it's it's not a particularly uh, easy thing to do and you need the proper tools to do it and then once it's all done you still have to interpret what all of these curves mean because they don't they don't really have a, a you know, what we would call a normal sort of visual, if you think about an on-axis or listening window curve, you know, we're used to just seeing something that's reasonably linear across the bandwidth, and, uh, you know, that, that represents a good frequency response. But there's quite a bit more to it, and um, I think that uh, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew now to explain a little bit more about these uh, family of amplitude response curves, and uh, thanks very much. I guess the first question is, what is the family of curves? And what we're looking at on the screen is a whole bunch of curves, amplitude responses measured here in the chamber, uh, where the speaker is measured at points all the way around the cabinet horizontally and then all the way around the cabinet vertically. And I guess one of the questions people often ask is, well, why do I care about what's coming out of the bottom of the speaker or the back of the speaker? when I can't hear that, because there is a misconception that some people have that the sound comes out of the front of the speaker and that's all we're worried about. Well, that would be the case if we listen to speakers inside an environment like this where there's no reflections. That's what an anechoic chamber is. Uh, but when you put the speaker in a normal room, and it doesn't matter how much damping or padding or furniture or carpet or whatever you have in the room, you get reflections. And those reflections are not predominantly the direct signal from the speaker. It's all of these off-axis measurements, all these positions that cause reflections coming all the way around the speaker, including behind it. Because even though there's no drivers back there, the low frequencies will have an impact behind the cabinet, 
the cabinet itself can radiate some sound. So we have to measure and have an idea of what the speaker is going to do in the room. And the best way to evaluate that is by looking at this family of curves. Now, this is obviously a mess and very difficult to interpret if you just looked at it in this method with all of these curves overlaid on one another. It doesn't tell you a heck of a lot. And if we looked at any of the individual curves in isolation, it also doesn't tell you a lot. Uh, many people think that you need a flat on-axis response. Well, that's nice to have, assuming that the family of curves looks smooth and even, too. Now, how we interpret this, this mess of curves is by looking at two main curves that we call the listening window and the sound power. And if I flip here... Ah, that's a little bit better, a little bit easier. We've got two curves we can look at. Now, the listening window takes into account the direct signal from the speaker and what are known as the first reflection points off of the sidewalls and the floor and the ceiling. And it averages those into this upper curve that you see. The sound power is an average of all of those curves that were on the previous page. And it's the interpretation of how you do the averaging that really is the magic of loudspeaker design. And even though companies like us, Paradigm, PSB, Harman, have a foundation in the NRC research that first brought to light this idea of a listening window and a sound power, it's the way that the averaging is done is really different between all the companies, and it's why all of our speakers sound a little bit different from one another. Um, but interpreting these curves we can understand really everything that the loudspeaker is doing and how it's going to interact with the room. Small changes that we bring to individual curves may or may not impact the listening window and the sound power, but we're always adjusting things to make these two curves look a certain way. And really, smoothness is something that we're looking for. We don't want big discontinuities in either the listening window or the sound power because that will suggest that there's an, an issue with the way the crossover has been designed. Now, listening window and sound power, this is showing a forward radiating speaker like the M80 we have the computer sitting on here. But the interpretation changes depending on how the speaker radiates sound. So, as many of you are aware, we have a speaker called the LFR 1100, which is an omnidirectional speaker. Uh, we call it omnidirectional because it radiates energy equally in all directions. And that's accomplished by putting drive units on the back of the speaker. Now, you'll see here that whereas the sound power curve and the listening window, the listening window is still on top, the shape is different. It's different simply because the speaker is radiating sound differently than the forward radiating speaker because we have that energy from the back. Now, looking at these curves, you'd say, well, is that good or is it not because it looks different than the other sound power curves we saw on the previous page. And here's where, again, it becomes a matter of interpreting exactly what these curves should be looking like. At the end of the day, all that really matters is that you have to consider all of these family of curves in trying to assess how the speaker is going to perform in the listening room. And that's why we actually place more importance on this family of measurements than, than anything else that we do in a speaker design. Yeah, and on this point of the omnidirectional speaker, um, it's if you tried to imagine a pure omnidirectional speaker where no matter where you measured the speaker, uh, it would have exactly the same amplitude response, then technically you would end up with a sound power listening window on axis curve that were all exactly the same curve. So it uh, then, then it creates a, a very interesting situation where the whole idea of what the listening window should look like, uh, reasonably linear, and then, and then a sound power curve that is sort of dropping by 8 or 10 dB across the bandwidth, all of that's sort of out the window, and uh, of course, Andrew has uh, vast experience in, in designing omnidirectional speakers, and uh, 
it makes for uh, quite an exciting challenge. But it, it is an important point about uh, listening tests as well, in that uh, really I, w I would say probably 80% of the listening tests that we do here, the double blind listening tests, are about the family of curves. So we will make small adjustments to the family of curves and subject that to a listening test to see if we can isolate measurements that can improve the sound quality. And um, probably a topic for another video is uh, about high Q versus low Q um, uh, things that you see in these amplitude response curves because um, you know, the lo low Q stuff in an ampli amplitude response curve can be um, uh, quite audible and uh, visually very hard to see. So, uh, so I think that uh, that probably wraps up most of what we can say about the family of curves other than to, to, to really reiterate that it's, it's not a topic that you can visually see when you look at a loudspeaker. I think if you looked at, say, the history of our speakers going back to 1980 and uh, the family of curves in the original speakers and what we knew about the family of curves then, it's vastly different to what is being done today because this is where we are learning things all the time. So even an M80, say, built in the mid-90s versus one built three or four years later and so on and so forth, and we, we give them new versions as we get uh, enough changes together. The real change is in this family of curves and what we've learned about it and how we're able to improve it, um, all going back to the results from blind listening tests.